Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. While we typically focus on local governance issues, we recognize the importance of the broader political landscape on municipal affairs. That's why here on this show, we decided to sit down with federal, provincial, and territorial leaders to delve into their perspectives on municipal governance and how their levels of government are addressing municipal concerns. Now, today's guest is Nahid Nenshi, the former three-term mayor of the city of Calgary and currently running to be the next leader of the Alberta NDP. In our one-on-one interview, we will discuss his leadership aspirations, his vision for Alberta's future, and perhaps most importantly for our audience and for myself, his vision for municipalities across the province, both urban and rural. This is Municipal Affairs. Nahid, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to get to know... After two and a half years, you've decided to make your entrance back into the political arena and run for the leadership of the Alberta NDP. What was that decision based on at the end of the day? Oh, so many things. You know, I've really been enjoying my last two and a half years, probably a couple of years since we've talked on this podcast, I think. Um, But I've really been enjoying myself uh, building a new kind of profession that I've really been liking, a little bit of teaching, a little bit of coaching. Uh, working with people around Canada and around the world and building stronger communities, making some money, doing well. But at the same time, I am an Albertan. And I've been very concerned about this province. I've been very concerned about the direction that this government is taking this province. You know, we're going to be talking a lot about municipalities today, and there's some very troubling things uh, going on on that front, uh, really ideologically driven, troubling things. But also, just in general, you know, I had six different premiers from three different political parties in the time that I was mayor. And, you know, they were varying degrees of good and bad. I agreed with some of their things. I disagreed with some of their things, but I've never experienced a government like this before. A government that is, you know, I've used some harsh language to describe them. I've said that they are both incompetent as well as dangerous and immoral. Um, What is more interesting, maybe for listeners to your show, is that I've never seen a government before that is so fundamentally disinterested in actually governing. It's like they're in a perpetual political campaign, but they don't actually want to run the province. And so for me, sometimes I say, they're like the dog that caught the car. What do I do with it now? You know, at least Jason Kenney had a bunch of ideological goals that he was trying to achieve. You know, for example, starve the universities so that they don't create opposition for him in the university. Even though this UCP government under under Danielle Smith is so ideological, I don't actually see any goals in what they're trying to do. You know, they seem to only know how to do two things, pick fights and waste money. And so I decided that, you know, I got to get myself engaged a little bit in trying to get better government here in Alberta. You know, one of the one of the moments for me for that was when it was very cold in January and we had uh, successive electricity grid alerts. And I won't get into the boring parts of the story, but I'll just say that I know a lot about the electric grid. You know, I had to run a utility for many years. And so I know how bad a grid alert is and what you have to do during a grid alert, which is immediately reduce consumption. So I thought, well, I better get online because I still have more of an online following than the premier does and amplify the premier's message to people because we got to reduce consumption immediately. And so I went to look at her messaging and her messaging was beating up on Stephen Gilbo, not telling people what to do, that we were in a very dangerous situation where it was below minus 40 in much of Northern Alberta. And we were at the brink of having, uh, having major blackouts and the people would have been very hurt. So When I realized that, and then the next day, by the way, probably because I goaded them into it, and also because it was an even more desperate situation, they actually did put out some messaging saying what to do. And the the premier even tweeted out a thank you to me for, (laughs) excuse me, for amplifying her message. And I should apologize for those who are listening who love my usual dulcet tones. I've got a bit of a sore throat after shaking so many hands this week. I've lost my pandemic influence discipline. Um, So I know I sound a little bit like a cartoon character, but I really wanted to talk to you. So nonetheless, hopefully we can make it through the conversation. But nonetheless, so the premier even tweeted out a thank you to me for saying uh, what I did and amplifying her message. And I realized, geez, if we're actually in an honest to goodness state of emergency, and this government doesn't know how to 
respond or doesn't have the instinct of how to look after people, we've got a really big problem. Now, you know that the following day, those in Alberta will recall, we actually got a cell phone alert saying, please reduce your use of electricity. And I've got a friend who has a place that overlooks a bunch of the city of Calgary. And she was saying that the moment the cell phone alert went out, she saw the lights go down across the city. And we did, in fact, save the grid that day. And the most important part for that for me was to remind me that when community takes small action together, when we look after one another together, we can make huge change. And it felt like the government has forgotten about that. So anyway, wrapping up this very long story, I didn't think it would be me. I didn't think it would be me standing out there getting back into politics again. You know, my line always was, we need a new premier and I hope it's somebody else. But I talked to Albertans, I've talked to NDP supporters and people who've never voted NDP in their lives from across the province. I learned a lot of things about the values that we share. I learned a lot of the things about that I didn't even know about where the NDP stands today, where Alberta's NDP stands today. But enough people said to me, look, Nahid, you have a very limited set of skills. There's not a lot you can do. But the one thing you are good at is try to bring people together around a common cause. And ultimately, that is when I decided that the need is so urgent for us to have a new provincial government that I needed to not be a bystander anymore, that I needed to actually get in, get back in the game and attempt to get that better government for Albertans. So there's a lot that I want to unpack when it comes to municipalities, because our show is more focused with municipal leaders from across the province of Alberta. Um, I, I kind of have to ask the first softball question, but important question. How do you see the relationship between municipalities in this province today? And the provincial government, you mean? And the provincial government, yeah, I apologize. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it couldn't be worse, right? Look, the province always fights with some municipalities, um, usually with Calgary and Edmonton. What Jason Kenney's government did was something very strange. They managed to irritate. Basically, there are three there are three sets of groups of municipalities in Alberta. There's really four, but let's just say three for now. One is Calgary and Edmonton. And so one job you can do is divide Calgary and Edmonton, get them fighting with one another if you're the provincial government. The second is what's now called Alberta Municipalities. I still think of it as the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, which is kind of the cities and towns and villages of Alberta. And then there's the Rural Municipalities Association, the RMA. And so what successive governments have done is they've played these groups off against one another. And Jason Kenney had the rare distinction of actually getting all of them to be mad at him all simultaneously, which very rarely happens to actually have Edmonton and the RMA and at Calgary and the RMA on the same side of every issue is quite a thing. And instead of fixing that, what Premier Smith has done is she's made it even worse. Uh, you know, for example, on the issue around the renewables ban, an issue where the RMA probably could have been a natural ally for her, she actually lied about it and said, oh, the RMA asked for this, much to the surprise of Paul McLaughlin, the head of the RMA who sort of grudgingly said, well, I guess we agree with it, but they never talked to us about it. Meanwhile, they are absolutely obsessed with, rather than make friends with the people that have been elected by the people in a more democratic process than provincial governments, they're absolutely obsessed with getting rid of those people and replacing them with their own puppets through the use of municipal political parties, which nobody wants, and no Albertans want, and nobody in government wants. And here's the thing, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in a second, Chris, it's going to backfire on them so badly. They're, they're just, they're not good at this. Um, so what happened in the Jason Kenney world is they put in new rules on municipal electoral financing um, to allow these third party advertisers to raise unlimited amounts of dark and corporate money, thinking that that would get conservatives elected. And what it ended up doing is that the labor movement and progressive funders actually used the loopholes better than the conservative funders did. And we ended up with progressive mayors and councils almost throughout the whole province. Um, so they don't know what they're doing. And what this municipal political parties thing, do they really think that a city like Edmonton is going to suddenly vote for conservatives municipally when they vote for new Democrats provincially or in Calgary? Uh, and what do they think is going to happen in the small towns and the rural areas? Most people won't even bother with this provincial party politics. So they're wasting a bunch of political capital for no good reason. 
Oh, and by the way, if they throw in an Alberta pension plan referendum into the municipal election and all the seniors come in anger to vote against the Alberta provincial uh, pension plan, they'll also be at the ballot box voting for people who hate the Conservatives for municipal government. So I don't know what they think they're doing. Of course, on more prosaic issues, the financing is terrible. They still aren't paying their property taxes. The municipal infrastructure fiscal framework makes no sense when you're adding this many people to the province every year. We've added two red deers to this province in one year. Have we built a single hospital bed? No. These people don't bring houses and doctors and clinics with them. And so, and they all come to the cities, let's be honest. The vast majority of inflow into Alberta is coming into the cities. So, and we won't build a South Edmonton hospital. So it's almost like they're angry at the cities, but they have no idea how to actually win votes there. Can I challenge you a little bit on that statement that you just made there? Because you you were a successful three-term mayor for the city of Calgary. And during that time, you created a uh, coalition of Calgarians who came with you every single election and voted for you. Do you think those, sort of using your analogy of putting political parties into the uh, municipal arena and hoping that conservatives will elect conservatives because they'll put a name on it, do you think you can bring the coalition that you built in Calgary to the NDP and help the NDP win in the next election? I mean, I hope so. Um, and I think that's really the goal here. And I, and I want to be very clear about something. So getting back to the leadership race, which is when I first started this, I started in my first couple of conversations by asking a question that I now realize was a really dumb question. And that question was, do you want to be pure or do you want to win? And I swiftly realized that that was a very wrong question to ask because the Alberta's NDP today, uh, the, the party that Rachel Notley and her team have built, is in fact a party, and I'm not going to use left, right, or center because I think that those words are meaningless to most Albertans, most people, but it is a party that broadly represents the median Albertan what people really believe in. So it's not a matter of changing the party or dragging it to the center or whatever. It's a matter of opening the doors to the party and helping them understand, helping Albertans understand that this party already reflects what they believe in and what they want. And that is, to get back to your question, that is kind of what we did in Calgary over three elections. You know, there were big time conservatives and big time liberals and big time new Democrats who all kind of came behind me because in that purple, they saw hope for, excuse me, what they believed in for their city. And so, so really, to me, that's what this is all about. It's not turning the orange of the NDP purple, but it's about using that little bit of purple as an invitation to people to come into the doors of the party. And, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll mangle this metaphor and stretch it to its limit if I can for a minute. The reason that I wear purple every day and I wore purple every day for 14 years is not because it brings out the color of my eyes. It's not just because it brings up the color of my eyes. And most people get that purple is a combination of liberal red and conservative blue. And it's calling people together into kind of that, what I call the muscular middle. But that's not really about left-right centrism. There's kind of a deeper meaning to it. The purple is actually about asking people to give up their identifications with their tribe or their clan and to define themselves by their common humanity and how we come together. And so adding a little bit of purple to the orange is really about that invitation. It's about opening that door for people. And I hope that that's how people see this uh, conversation. And certainly in the last two and a half weeks since I launched, the support from across the political spectrum, if you believe in such things, but from across every community in Alberta has been overwhelming. You know, we've signed up volunteers, I'm told, from every municipality in Alberta except for two. And they won't tell me which two because they know I'll go there immediately and stand on the street corner and say, volunteers needed. Um, we have signed up thousands and thousands of memberships, tens of thousands of memberships. But uh, what's most interesting to me is that you know, when I ran for mayor the first time, by the end of a six or seven month long election, we had signed up about 11 or 1200 volunteers. And nobody had ever seen that number of volunteers get interested in a municipal election before. On our first day of launching this bid, we signed up three times that number. 
So I've set myself a stretch goal that I want more than 10,000 volunteers across Alberta working on this campaign, not so much for this campaign, but because win or lose on June 21st, those people will become part of a movement. And that this movement in every corner of Alberta will carry us through the next three years into a general election and beyond that to keep the new NDP government, inshallah, as we Muslims say, God willing, honest and focused on the needs of Albertans. So it's really very much people powered, which is really exciting. And let me say one more thing about that, which is, you know, when I stood this week in front of a standing room only break uh, up to the rafters crowd and got a rapturous standing ovation in Red Deer. And then when I stood in front of a group of people that caused me to remind my campaign that I used to be the mayor. And so I actually do care about things like fire codes and safety. And you have to close the registrations at some point. But, you know, we had 1400 people signed up to come see me in Edmonton. And again, a rapturous standing ovation, um, which is pretty exciting. But I'm under no illusions that these people are thrilled about this handsome face I've got. I've been talking to a lot of people and asking them, what, why are you here? Why did you park five blocks away and bring yourself into this room, even though you walk with a cane? You know, what's this about? And everyone's been telling me exactly the same thing, which is for the first time in a long time, in our broken and dispirited and divisive political discourse, people are giving themselves permission to hope for a better future. Instead of just fighting for what we've got to hope that something better is possible. And if they see me as the conduit of that, that's pretty exciting. So I can tell you of our volunteer base, about one third, and, and, and I think that's emblematic of the supporters that we're bringing to the party and the coalition. Probably now about 20 or 25% of that base are people who've been with me in Calgary through three elections, the purple people, Team Nenshi. That's probably about one fifth to one quarter of the base. About a third of the base is stalwart NDP supporters. Frankly, I didn't think I would do that well with stalwart NDP supporters. I thought that they might see me as sort of this purple outsider from Calgary who's just coming into the race. But they've been great. Um, and they've really been helping me understand the party, what's working, what isn't working, how they can do better. So I have, I think, uh, as of today, I have almost as many MLA endorsements as any other candidate, almost as many as Kathleen Ganley, and more than Sarah Hoffman, who's been with the party for so long. My MLA endorsements, by the way, include the self-described most left-wing member of the caucus and the most right-wing member of the caucus which I find kind of interesting. Um, but lots and lots of volunteers, lots of former candidates, lots of former uh, folks who worked with the MLA. So I'm super, uh, worked with the NDP. So I'm super excited about that. But the remainder of the base, probably approaching half, maybe even a little more than half now, are people who have never belonged to a political party before. People who probably have never volunteered on a political campaign before. And they're there because they're seeing a better hope for Alberta. So that's a very long answer to your question about coalition building. But I think that's exactly what we're engaged in right now. So that coalition building is great. But if elected the next leader of the Alberta NDP, and if you are successful in the next election as the leader to be the next premier, municipalities are under very tough challenges right now. As you've mentioned at the beginning of this interview, infrastructure deficits, cost of living is going through the roof. Residents are leaving their homes and moving into larger urban centers. How does the former mayor of Calgary connect with the mayor of Fort Vermilion, connect with the mayor of Bassano, connect with the mayor of Bon Accord to address all the issues that municipalities are facing? So, no municipality feels like they're being left behind, but at the same time, understanding that we don't want to run up a massive deficit to help all municipalities go through all their issues that they're currently dealing with. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and, and I will take your word for it that those are actually real places that you mentioned. No, I'm kidding. Of course, I know those places. Um, you know, by pure luck, uh, when I went on my first trip to Edmonton since after declaring the very next day, it happened to be the Alberta municipalities. Uh, spring convention. And so I did what I do, which is I crashed their hospitality suite party. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it was really wonderful to meet up with people from the places like you mentioned. I'm trying to actually think if I met Bassano Bonacord or Fort Vermillion while I was there. But boy, did I ever meet people from across the whole province from, well, from even Carbon, then, like Gregorville Duchess. and Legal. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I was just chatting with people from all over. And the very first person who I saw when I came in was a very enthusiastic deputy mayor from Peace River who I don't recall meeting before, but she says we've met at Alberta municipalities in the past. And she gave me a big hug and she said, I cannot believe you made me buy an NDP membership. And I said to her, you know, I've just come from the NDP office and I had to drop off my uh, my nomination signatures. And the very first page, of, and, and it had to be on paper and people had to FedEx them. It was, it was quite the story. So I had the stack of handwritten forms and... I looked down at the forms just as I was handing them in. And the first page was an entire page from Peace River, which I don't think I've ever visited Peace River. And so that was pretty exciting for me. And it came with a required promise for me to come visit Peace River ASAP. But the idea here is that I built those relationships over my years as mayor uh, with the municipal councillors in all of those places and really tried to help understand what the needs are in all these different spots, right? So infrastructure, broadband, uh, healthcare, education, these are things that both the municipal councils, but also the people who live in these places really are interested in. And I think that the Alberta NDP sits in a good place for them. But you highlighted a really important thing. These last years of government, probably since 2015, so we've gone through nearly a decade of real austerity in our provincial budgets. And that austerity has been on the backs of public services. And so getting this right is going to take a deft hand. Some of it is what's what I call problem solved by money, PSMs. But the fact is there's not going to be endless money. And, you know, I do believe because you have to when you're a municipal politician and spending what you bring in, right? I had 11 straight uh, consecutive surpluses. Our property taxes in Calgary, despite what some may say, remain the lowest, the residential property taxes were the lowest of any big city in Canada. And so, so there is a trick to getting this right. It's going to be very hard after a decade or more of getting it wrong. Um, and, you know, and I, and, you know, you notice I include the 2015 NDP government in that. It wasn't their fault. They had the bad, bad, bad luck of taking office right at the moment where there was no more money. But then when the money started to flow, the UCP didn't invest it in the places they needed to invest it in. And so with the population growing as much as it is, we are falling further and further behind. This feels a lot like the 1990s when we balanced the fiscal budget, but we created a giant social deficit. And so we've got to be able to get that right. But here's the good news. When you're the mayor, your entire job is finding money. You got to go find money wherever you can and focus it on the services that people need. So I know that sounds a little naive, but ultimately that's my job. I got to find the money and figure out how to work on this. But I will Would also you, say- Sorry, sorry. I want to just check check that for a second because when I speak to municipal leaders and I on this show, I hear often that there's a lot of downloading going on from the province to the municipalities sure. around mental health and addictions, around social issues, homelessness. that homelessness mm-hmm. as well. And I'm not talking about big uh, sort of mid-sized cities, if you will. I'm talking about even rural communities who are dealing with this mm-hmm. issue more and more. Would would a Nenshi government, would a Nenshi led Alberta NDP upload some of those costs or start funding them correctly to offset some of these issues that the municipalities so they can sort of play in their jurisdictional role of well, wastewater, water, garbage, property taxes, services. Would I'm not that sure happen? That it's really, I'm not sure it's really a question of uploading the downloading. You know, uh, Premier Ford in Ontario talks a lot about uploading these days while the municipalities are still in worse shape, right? But it's a matter of both figuring out the right way to deliver the service and then funding it appropriately. And so it may well be that local solution. So I'll use the example you just gave, uh, mental health and addiction. So I had chosen to make the corner piece of my third term as mayor, the creation of Canada's first community-based action plan on mental health and addiction. And what we learned through the development of that plan was that, A, it's really complicated. 
but B, sometimes the solutions can be found in the community and it can be actually quite easy. So one piece of that plan is about community safety, how to help people who are suffering from mental illness stay safe or addiction stay safe, but also how to keep people who encounter folks in crisis to feel safe. And I always used to use an analogy and I said, listen, when you call 911, you get Calgary 911, police, fire or ambulance. But if your loved one is going through a mental health crisis, which of those three do you pick? Police, fire, or ambulance? Probably not fire, but police, well, some cases, the presence of a police officer can make the matter worse. The most dangerous thing can be the presence of a police officer. If you pick ambulance, what are they going to do? They'll take your loved one to an emergency room where they'll sit for 15 or 20 or 24 hours. They may get a psychiatric hold for a couple of days, then they're right back out in the community. And so I always used to use the analogy, can you imagine if you called 911 and you heard police, fire, ambulance, or mental health? So here's the thing, in Calgary today, if you call 911, you hear police, fire, ambulance, or mental health. And there's a team of mental health first responders who will go to the site, figure out what's going on, and hook the person up with the services that they need on site. But do you know what, Chris, the reason I tell you that as part of this answer is, do you know how many people we had to hire in the whole city of Calgary to create a mental health first response team? Any guesses? I'd say probably. The answer is go, hunt. go ahead. Yeah. The answer is 19. I would have said about 100, so, so I was way off. Yeah. And so when you think about the fact that there's 1,500 police officers hiring a mental health response team for 19 people is actually really cheap, but it's making unbelievable differences in people's lives. And so getting these things right, instead of just fighting with the municipalities all the time is really the trick. You know, the UCP did something that I thought was unconscionable, which is they chose their friends on the Calgary and Edmonton city councils and appointed them to some fake community safety task force without actually talking to the mayor or council about their actual plans they have in place. It was purely performative. It was never intended to actually help the situation. And it was just, again, picking political fights, which is all this government seems to know how to do. So I cannot guarantee to all municipalities, you're gonna get all the money you want um, because of the mess that the UCP is making of the budget. It's gonna take some time to unwind and fix that. But I can promise them that they're gonna be dealing with a government that treats them with respect a government that doesn't try to push its ideology on them and a government that actually understands that they too were elected and they too need to be accorded the kind of respect that goes with that. I'm cautious of time here. And I have one last question before we start doing a wrap up here, Nahid, and that is health. Healthcare is one of these issues that I, when I speak to municipal leaders in the rural setting, rural municipalities is a common concern, especially with lack of sh doctor shortages, lack of nurse practitioners, nurses. Emergency room closures. Exactly. I heard one story from a uh, representative from the special areas boards who said that when their local emergency room closed, they had to go to Saskatchewan to get the closest emergency room because that was the closest to them. We saw recently in January where a mother from Milk River had to drive all the way up to Lethbridge to access an emergency room because there was no. Would healthcare be a priority for you if elected? Well, I mean, of course, you know, we've been talking a lot about for years now, we've been talking about how our healthcare system is on the brink of collapse. In many areas in Alberta, particularly in rural Alberta, let's just be honest, the healthcare system has collapsed. And if you are living in a world where you have to drive past two closed emergency rooms on a weekend to get to one that's open, uh, where nobody has a family doctor, where we haven't leveraged the use of technology to at least provide people with consultations that aren't, you know, used by UCP friends and donors to enrich themselves. Like the whole thing is a mess. And obviously we need to encourage more healthcare practitioners to take up space in rural Alberta, to take up their practices, to invest their lives in outside of the major centers. And there are incentives that you can use to help do that around foreign credentials, bringing in people from other places, making it easier for them to practice in their profession, financial incentives to practice in places where they are needed more. All of this matters. And, you know, urban health is a huge issue, and that is going to be the major portion of the budget because it is where most of the people live. But we do have to figure out how to solve these problems in other places as well, understanding 
that, you know, a fully equipped cath lab in every rural area isn't going to happen, but how can we actually figure out how to help people? And, and by the way, why can't we have a cath lab in our third largest city where there's already a hospital ready for it? And we've been talking about it for years. You know, I met someone in Red Deer when I was there who told me, an older gentleman, who told me he'd had a heart attack in the fall, and his wife said he had 17% chance of survival, and they had to airlift him to Edmonton, where he got his stent just in time. But he only needed one stent. If that had been a quadruple bypass situation, probably he wouldn't have been with us today. And so these are the things that we need to make sure that people have equitable access to these things, right? And by the way, I'll tell you a funny story, which is I was speaking in Edmonton and I was speaking about healthcare, and I learned something as a relative newcomer to the NDP that if you use the word invest, which I just did, some people in the NDP think that's a dangerous word because it talks about private investors and all of that. But I want to be I want to be very clear to say, look, every single nurse who chooses to make her career in Alberta has invested in the healthcare system. She's invested her life in the healthcare system. Every single family doc who opens a practice has invested not just her life, but also her money in creating the system. And so we are all invested in the Alberta healthcare system. And yes, there are private investors who do, in fact, run a portion of the system right now. And with those folks, we also need to make sure they're at the table because we have to make sure that they are protecting worker rights that they're providing adequate levels of care. It has to be regulated. We look at, for example, the home care system, which uses a variety of private providers, some of whom, frankly, need, uh, well, well, let's just, uh, without getting into that example, let's talk about the example of Motel Medicine in Edmonton. What happened there? We had a private nonprofit provider who clearly was not providing the level of care that they said they were providing for the funding they were getting. So those people have to be at the table for us to say, look, these are the regulations that you need to be able to follow if you're going to be part of the system. And we have to make sure that the that the system is public health care publicly delivered. These things really matter. But we also have to do that recognizing that there are multiple players throughout the system right now. And it does us no good to basically say that some people's voices don't matter. So... We are, by the time this airs, we're about 20 days away from the date that memberships have to be bought to be a member to vote in the upcoming Alberta NDP leadership uh, race. Why should people take out a membership and support Nahid Nenshi for the next leader of the Alberta NDP? Well, the first thing that I should say, which doesn't apply to anybody who listens to this podcast, is that I have learned, much to my shock and horror, that there are our neighbors out there, Albertans, who do not live and breathe politics 24-7. You know, right? They have like lives and hobbies and families. You mean and Twitter and social media is not the norm, Nahid? Come on. No. And the single most common thing that I have heard from people is, gosh, I love you. I can't wait to vote for you. When's the election again? Didn't we just have an election? Isn't it like three years from now? And so I have to explain to them, look, I got to be the leader of the party first. Do you have a membership? And my usual answer is a blank stare. A membership in what exactly? So I need to tell everyone who's listening to this podcast who already knows you need to have a membership before April 22nd to vote. You got to go to nenshi.ca, put down your $10 and, um, and vote. And by the way, I should add that the Alberta New Democrats are very interested in a broad-based democracy. So the, the requirements for who can vote are different. You don't have to be 18. Anyone over 14 can vote. I'm super excited because my 15-year-old niece is going to vote in her first election. By the way, she's put on the whiteboard in her room a facsimile ranked ballot and how she's going to vote. And she changes the names on the ballot based on the news of the day because she's kind of a nerd. And I'm only slightly offended that my name does not, in fact, appear on her facsimile ranked ballot. But... Um, but in any case, um, so you can be over 14, you don't have to be a Canadian citizen, you can be a permanent resident, refugee, international student, if you want to vote. If you are a student who studies outside of Alberta, you can still take out a membership if you're ordinarily resident in Alberta. Um, so that's number one. And so for the people who listen to this podcast, I got to say, you all know this, but your friends and family don't know this. So you got to spread the word to tell people to put down their $10 in order to become part of this process of voting. The voting, by the way, is an online vote. You'll get your ballot in the mail in early June, as long as you remember by the end of April. 
But to your point of why it should be me, you know, my campaign slogan is for Alberta, for all of us. And when I wrote that slogan, I thought I would say it like that, that the, the, the emphasis on the slogan would be on the word Alberta and on the word all, because we have a government that is not acting for all of us or in the best interests of the province. And what I've learned is that the real power of that slogan is that actually that tiny word for, F-O-R. Because for so long, our political discourse has encouraged us, has trained us to only be against, to be against Ottawa to be against people that disagree with us, to be against newcomers, to be against LGBTQ people, to be against environmentalists, to be against the energy sector, simply to be against, to be against each other. And what I'm hearing from, Albert, from Albertans around the province is that they are ready to be for, for something that is greater than all of us, for community, for building something better for, for, for the, all the next generations. And that's why I'm excited to put my name forward to be your next Premier of Alberta. And I hope that we'll all come together for Alberta, for all of us. So to, to wrap the interview up, I have one last question, but it piggybacks onto that statement there. But before I ask the question, I should mention the links to uh, Nenshi's, uh, Nahid's uh, uh, website and social media and the link to buy a membership are in the show notes. Or if you're listening to this via podcast, but in your car, pull over and then buy a membership. If you're listening, watching this it's on YouTube. Nenshi.ca. You don't have Nenshi. to do it in the car. You <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um my last question for you, and I've asked all the other uh, uh, candidates for the leadership, how does a Nenshi Alberta differ from a Smith Alberta? It's bigger, it's kinder, it's smarter, and it's more capable. Um, it's not a Nenshi Alberta. It'll be a Nenshi government, but it's an Albertans Alberta. And we already have the, we are so blessed in this place with abundant physical resources and natural resources. We're blessed with the smartest brains in the world, abundant human resources, if you want to put it that way. And we get to live under that big blue prairie sky. So Albertans have it. Albertans know exactly who we are and who we want to be. And it's time for a government that reflects those values and those dreams that are only as big as that sky. Nahid, thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure and good luck on the rest of thank the campaign you. for yourself. Thank you so much. Take care. Now, before we let you go, I should note that for transparency's sake, my husband, one of the producers of this show, The Municipal Affairs, the Honorable Ricardo Miranda, served as an Alberta NDP MLA and cabinet minister in Rachel Notley's cabinet from 2015 to 2019. So if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all their diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few years. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.